Uh, all right, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, the the audiovisual problems still seem to be going on here, but they're getting a little bit better. So I apologize for the couple minutes uh, delay here. Um, hope everybody had a good weekend. Hope everybody had a restful weekend. Uh, it, yes, no. Oh man, everybody's still asleep. 8 a.m. class. Okay. Um, what I planned today was to do a little live Zoom with some of our colleagues in New Orleans to hear how the hurricane hit, and uh, we we set that up. But um, uh, most of my friends there are offline at the moment. Shocker, shocker. So um, so we'll see if we can do that. Um, and, and so instead, I, I uh, made a backup video, which this is about like 10, 15 minutes, but just sort of a compilation of some of the, the news coverage of what's been going on, so we can talk about that. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, coastal, thinking, thinking about the coast and how we think about the coast, et cetera, today. Um, but because yesterday was the 16th anniversary of the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, and because Hurricane Ida made landfall yesterday, also yesterday at about noon, it seems like we should at least take a few minutes, a little half hour or so here, and just sort of touch on briefly, even though we've, we're barely getting into coastal. We haven't even, we've just started doing some readings and stuff. So we don't really have all the frames of reference, but hopefully this will be of interest and uh, maybe something we can refer back to as we go throughout the semester. Sound good? Okay. So <clears throat> this is uh, obviously Ida as uh, the hurricane was, was approaching New Orleans. And just to, to orient you, so we're looking at the, the Gulf Coast here. So here's Texas on over to Florida. And Louisiana is right here. Um, and, uh, and this is as the eye was coming uh, it was, was making landfall. Um, so this is a, a NOAA National Weather Service satellite looking down, and this is false color. Um, and we have many, many more tools now than we did um, even a few decades ago. Certainly uh, more tools than we had a century ago when we first started the modern science of tracking hurricanes, etc. And this has dramatically helped us in terms of predicting things. Uh, and, and being able to forecast, say, the paths of storms, how intense the rainfall will be, what the impact might be in location X, that type of stuff. Um, so I could, I could jump to some National Hurricane Center data, but maybe we'll start with um, just talking about uh, this event. So um, not trying to segue into my class on disasters, but... but um, uh, I would argue that there's no such thing as a, for the most part, no such thing as a natural disaster anymore. We have so influenced the goings on on our planet and, um, and through, through the things we've decided to do and the things we've opted not to do and just sort of do inadvertently, um, one, we're, we're oftentimes making these disasters more intensive and problematic than they otherwise would be. And um, because of the ubiquity of our society and how tied we are in various uh, places and, and things, um, we actually make the consequence of the quote unquote natural disaster more complicated. So the old idea was a natural disaster was something like a lightning strike, right? And a, a human caused disaster was something like a fire that you started in your house kind of thing. And again, those, those seem to really be blending. And we now understand quite well that as these, um, frequency, intensity, duration of these events get um, crazier and crazier, we are experiencing more and more impacts. This is the cover of the um, Times-Picayune web, web page, uh, which is the, the, used to be the newspaper of record for the city of New Orleans. When Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005, this was the hurricane of record. So this is what, you, this is what our friends in New Orleans are waking up to today. There is no power, so there's a million people without power. Um, since yesterday. Um, and uh, they, obviously the printing presses can't print, the streets are flooded, that kind of stuff. Um, so this was how people got information, particularly in the in the first hours and first days, was this web presence. Times-Picayune doesn't exist anymore. They'll tell you it exists, it doesn't. They got into a feud with the power broker. The, the, so, so the state capital is in Baton Rouge in Louisiana. New Orleans is off to the east. New Orleans is weird. New Orleans has a bunch of gay folks, and New Orleans has a bunch of music, and it's just very different um, than much of the rest of the of the state of Louisiana. 
and this has gone on for, for centuries, and there's all kinds of history. If you guys are interested, you should come with me to Louisiana in the spring. But um, suffice it to say, these guys ticked off some of the power brokers in um, Baton Rouge. So the local Baton Rouge paper was called The Advocate. And um, the person that essentially uh, a bankrolled that paper didn't like what was going on in New Orleans. So he swore he would destroy this paper, and he succeeded. So now the advocate has purchased the Times-Picayune, and, uh, and a few years ago, uh, it folded the largest uh, city in the U.S. to not have a daily newspaper. And it's hard to explain how important this newspaper was culturally, not just for hurricanes and disasters and things, but for having conversations about managing the coast, um, um, all, all kinds of stuff. It was, it was a very beloved um, part of the community. So now it's, it's, it's a shadow of its former self, and um, it is no longer the resource that people can turn to in a disaster. There, there's still some fantastic people working for there. They're still doing some fantastic journalism, but it's, it's, a, it's a shell. What we find with coastal management, with coastal resilience, just like many other of our, of our resource management issues, we need everybody playing along to make these, these management decisions work, right? right? We need the journalists, we need the citizens engaged, we need people thinking critically, we need people criticizing, all of that stuff. And when we start to fray this, it causes problems and we eventually see it in our management. Okay, so this is a, a picture from uh, our friend uh, Katie Braystead's house who runs, I'm gonna turn on Zoom real quick just on the off chance that she actually is gonna jump on, which I don't think she will. Uh, but I'll turn this on real quick. Give me one second here. And uh, let's see. So let's see if she pops on. I don't think she will. Um, uh, what was I saying? Uh, so okay. So this is this is her house in um, uh, an area where uh, you and your fellow students have been working for uh, about 15 years or so. Um, uh, in, this is technically in the, what we would call the county, they call them the parishes. The, so the parish of Orleans, just on the edge of the Orleans Plaquemines Parish. And Plaquemines Parish is, is the parish, again, or the county that um, is the Bird's Foot Delta, is the Mississippi Delta that, that goes down to the, to the ocean, basically. Um, and so as of yesterday afternoon, she said the only thing that happened was this oak tree fell on their house. <laughs> and so... Uh, thankfully, it doesn't look like there's any punctures. At least there wasn't as of as of yesterday. But um, uh, this is life in southern Louisiana. This is a um, satellite image as it was making as Hurricane Ida was making landfall yesterday at about midday. And um, so again, just to orient you, so so here is this is the outline of, the, of Louisiana. Okay, in Louisiana, it kind of looks like a boot, right? We have a, like sort of the toe over here and the bulk of the you see my cursor there? Yeah, okay. And, and the, the bulk of the, the, the sort of state is up here. And um, uh, this is um, a oil and gas, oh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a harbor, it's a port, but primarily it's, there's a little bit of fishing activity, but primarily it exists to serve the oil and gas uh, activity offshore um, of Louisiana, which is massive and huge. Um, and so the eye of the hurricane, which is, um, so a hurricane is an extreme chunk of low pressure in the atmosphere. And because when we change pressure, uh, air masses move to go from a high to low, et cetera. Um, uh, for a whole bunch of things, I'm not going to give my hurricane lecture today. Um, it, it basically, uh, the wind was, as, as, they're, as they're moving around, they can start to spin. And that's when we get the cyclonic motion. And that's when we get this classic uh, so-called tropical depression, tropical cyclone. And all these terms you might hear, major hurricane, tropical storm, it's all the same thing. It's just a matter of how intense it is. And so uh, they're spinning around in the center of the storm, in the so-called eye of the storm. It's mellow. It's, there's not a lot going on. All the activity is around it. And in this case, the intensity of the color indicates the rainfall. Um, uh, and, and so the, the hotter the color, the more rainfall is falling. And these folks, unfortunately, at uh, Port Fouchon or got hit pretty hard. So um, I was trying to get some updates before we started class, but the sun just came up a couple hours ago and, and they're still trying to figure out what's what. So huge, huge problems going on, but, um, but no, not a lot of 
reports coming out. Throughout the day, I'm sure we'll get more reports. This is an aerial satellite image of what Port Fouchon looks like. And you're like, what's that? It's a port. And pretty much all of those structures, or just about all those structures, are something to support oil and gas extraction. So those are oil and gas storage tanks. Those are, those are um, holding facilities, all kinds of stuff. And, and suffice it to say, these things don't do well with 150 mile an hour winds, which is what the speed of the wind was when it was make, when, when um, the storm made landfall yesterday. Um, we use a, a, a five point scale to, to talk about hurricanes. So category one is and based on wind speed. So category one starts around 70 miles per hour and it's, it's sort of the, the least intense all the way up to five, which is the strongest. Um, uh, a Category 5 storm starts at 150, you, you first enter it when you cross the 157 mile per hour wind uh, speed threshold. And this was again 150, so it was almost a Category 5 storm. Um, and suffice it to say, uh, infrastructure doesn't do too well in this. All kinds of things have made our hurricanes more problematic. Not just our development and our, and our human settlement patterns, but also things like this, climate change. So what we're looking at here is a so-called loop current. This is the amount of hot water, not just on the surface of, in this case, the Gulf of Mexico, but uh, down deep, down to like 700 feet or so deep. Um, and again, without going into details, suffice it to say, it's much warmer than it normally would be, and that's fueling, um, the, so that, that gives strength to the hurricane. Hurricane Katrina, when it came on shore, um, uh, or when it came towards shore, I should say, Weakened, 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 weakened. By the time Hurricane Katrina made landfall, it was only a Category 3 storm. By the time it got to the city of New Orleans, it was only a Category 1 storm. Um, much of the story of Hurricane Katrina is failed management. Obviously, these giant storms like this, we'll watch some video in a, in a minute or two here. Um, and Katie's not jumping on, so I'm just going to go ahead and kill our uh, Zoom here. Cool. Okay, so uh, obviously, you know, tons of rainfall, tons of wind, you know, those are all problematic. Those would be problematic for us, anybody around the planet. The story with Hurricane Katrina, though, was the story of New Orleans and the story of the rest of the region. The rest of the region got screwed, um, got, got, you know, hammered and hurt and all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't necessarily destroyed. Katrina if we had followed what we were supposed to have done, mandated by Congress in the 60s, and erected a, a proper so-called flood protection barrier, the levee system, the, the area, the walls surrounding the city of New Orleans, the worst that would have happened is, you know, I don't know, six inches of rain or something like that, right? So maybe people's cars would have been wet, or maybe their cars would have been a little bit underwater, or their, their ankles would have been underwater, or their calves would have been underwater, but that would have been it. And then it would have, it would have, it, came through pretty fast, leaves, and then we would just dry out. That is not what happened to the city of New Orleans. What happened was this massive barrier that you all paid for, that we all paid for, um, failed utterly in dozens of locations. It was designed crappily, had no oversight in terms of the infrastructure that was put in, and was not properly maintained. And so all of those things are totally applicable to the types of things that we talk about in this class and the type of activities going on here in California or New York or Hawaii or wherever we want to pick. Um, uh, so uh, in this case, with Ida, instead of slowing down as it got to the, to the shoreline, it got more intense and it ramped up. So... It was almost to a five by the time it got to um, land, and that is because of, and that seems to be because of um, this loop current and this, this um, really, really, really sort of fueling heavy um, source of energy. Uh, so, so uh, we we oftentimes hear people talk about wind speed, which is huge. I hear about rainfall, but on the immediate coast, it's the storm surge that causes problems. So, first thing to say is this part of the country is not like here. Not like here. In many, in many, many ways, shape and form. So we have an up-down coast. We have a baby coast. We have a precocious coast. We have uh, cliffs that go up and down, right? So if we go, if we get in a car right now and drive to Malibu, uh, Malibu Beach, 
Magoo, Be Magoo Beach, right? Pick up a rock, throw that rock as hard as we can. It's going to plop, hit the water, and sink. And it'll go down, who knows, 60 feet, 90 feet, something like that, right? If we go to, if we we're in Louisiana right now, and, we went, and it wasn't a hurricane, and we walked to the edge and we picked up a, a similar size rock and threw it with just the same amount of force, just the same uh, heft, and it plunked in the water and it goes down, it would go down about three feet. So this is a very flat, very eroded part of our country. And so um, this is a place where they have water tanks, right? Because we put our water tanks up on the hills, right? They don't have hills. So they, they erect metal structures to put their water in. So if there's a fire or a power failure, the gravity will allow that water to come down and they can have you know, water for, for a bit. So uh, really, really flat land. So the story I always tell about that is when, I, when um, uh, my wife and I were going to go to Belize for our honeymoon, but we were too poor, so we couldn't afford it. So we went to the Florida Keys instead. We, we flew into Miami, and then we went to, by the Everglades. And uh, we're driving the Everglades, and I'm looking in this direction. This is before Google Maps. I know it's very hard to, very hard to understand. So we're driving in there, driving in the, in the um, uh, Everglades, and we're looking for this thing, and my wife's like, I think we passed it. I'm like, no, woman. Like, what are you talking about? We didn't pass it. She's like, yeah, I, I was supposed to pound, uh, we were supposed to go past like something like two miles or something like that, past Mount, whatever the hell it was called, Mount, Mount Blah Blah Blah. I was like, we haven't pa passed Mount Blah Blah Blah. And we were driving, and you know, it was supposed to be just a few minutes to this, to this destination, and we're going, and it's five minutes and 10 minutes and 15 minutes, and it's like, oh, God, I missed it. So my wife's like, see, told you. I'm like, be quiet. And then so we turn around, go back. And I'm like, how did I miss it? The mount thing was a six-inch bump in the road. So that was a mountain in South, in South uh, Florida, right? So I was like, that's ridiculous. And I said, it wasn't my fault. It was your fault. And it was true. Anyway, so, um, so that's what we're talking about, right? Geographies where a couple feet is a massive amount of difference. So check this out. This was the modeling. I haven't seen the final data because it's hard to, when the power goes out, it's hard to get some of this data live fed sometimes. So we'll get the, the final results in a couple days. But, but there were, we were predicting on the order of, as the hurricane was approaching the shore, 7 to 11 feet. So to be clear, a storm surge is not a wave. It's not a whoa, 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 7 feet of water and then goes down. It is the ocean just goes that high and stays that high it's, it's a wall of water that's shoved forward by the winds and the movement of the storm itself. So the water goes up that high and stays that high for who the hell knows? Four hours, six hours, 10 hours, right? And 11 feet, that's crazy. One of the towns we've been working on rebuilding and helping recover for these last many years, uh, sort of near the, the end of the Mississippi Delta, uh, they had 21 foot storm surge in Katrina. So, so the storm surge for the immediate folks on the coast is a real, real problem. And a lot of the damage in the immediate coastal zone comes from that to fishing vessels, to, to docks and harbors and, and, and freeways along the roads, stuff like that. Um, okay, and so we, I can click on this and we can zoom in. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, this data is still being updated. Um, and we've gotten much better at trying to understand this and predict it. Um, It'll be great in a couple days once we have all the data in, and you can go in, or anybody could go in, uh, a local uh, you know, elected official, a homeowner, a business owner, anybody, and look, and you can, even though we can't get into these sites, you could get a sense of how, how bad the damage was in all these areas. And the blue dots just indicate monitoring stations, and this is the path of the hurricane. This is the historic path of the hurricane, and this is the predicted future track with a cone so-called cone of uncertainty. Um, so climate change is making the management of the coast harder, right? Another thing are the direct actions that we've taken. So this is a map of, again, uh, Louisiana. So, uh, so here we are. So Lake Pontchartrain is up here. This is the Mississippi River, this dark, this dark squealy line. Um, this, is, this is where the French Quarter is. Can you guys see that okay? Is it, let me turn, let me turn down the lights. Hold on. Let's see if this will help. Hold on. Is that good? Is that better? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and as always, I said this before, I know we're just still starting the class up, but you guys interrupt me. If I say something doesn't make sense or something is weird or, or what have you, go ahead and, and just 
shout out or raise your hand or whatever. Um, okay, so this is a, this is a map from the USGS of this part of the country where Ida has just struck. Um, and so here is the Mississippi River, the delta, the dumpings, the 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 sediment dropped from this river, which drains 40% of the United States of America, is what has created this massive delta. And in fact, our geology friends will tell us that there are s at least seven distinct lobes that we can measure. So over so, so consistent periods where the river has jumped over to here or over there in recent geologic history. And, uh, and they spend a lot of their time looking at that and all that kind of good stuff. Suffice to say, this is a big delta. So this is where you enter the Mississippi River if you're a ship, let's say, and you can go all the way up to uh, the port of New Orleans. Uh, the, the gray or the black area here indicate areas of open water, so ocean. Um, this is called, these things are called lakes, this is called Lake Pontchartrain. Um, it's actually technically not a lake. It actually connect, you can't quite see it here because I've zoomed in a bit, but, but up, up here there's a connection to the ocean. So it's actually just a, a really weird embayment. So it's seawater, it's, it's, it's salty water. Whereas the water here in the river, in the Mississippi River, is fresh water. Um, and so what we're looking at, and anybody have a guess as to what, what these colors represent? Uh, sedimentation, okay, good guess, good. Yeah, exactly. So these are areas that were wetland, that were salt marsh um, before, but over the last several decades have disappeared because of our management practices. First and foremost, levying the Mississippi, not allowing that sediment to jump out of the channel and do its natural replenishment of of the floodplain as it as it normally should and as it needs to do. And then other things like massive oil and gas extraction, which act like, like you're drinking a Coke and you jam your straw in the Coke and you take a sip, right? You take a little bit of volume out of the bottom of the drink and then the overall level of the glass goes down. So same thing is happening, uh, uh, subsidence because of uh, removing um, that material uh, uh, from subsurface. And there's other things, there's nutrient and other things that cause problems. But, but the key point is all the colors, all the blue colors are land lost before Katrina. The red is land lost in the immediate wake of Katrina. So that one storm jumped us forward at the rate we were losing wetlands. That one storm jumped us forward, forward many decades to maybe a century or so in terms of at the rate we we're going. So these, these pulse disturbances in the coastal zone can be hugely important. It's, it's also the long-term stressors, but also these short-term stressors can actually cause us lots of problems. We've seen that with wildfires, same kind of idea, same kind of idea. Um, and so, so the red is, is recent, and then the green is where we've added wetlands. So, uh, you know, there's a lot more red and blue than there is green, right? So that's the big story. Where we work, so Katie's house where I showed this, like this, this house right here. That house is right here, and it's near where we have been working for, for many years. And again, if you guys come with me in the spring, you guys can come and, and help us work on this project, help us monitor what's going on with some wetland restoration. Um, but uh, where, where we work here, it used to be on the order of, uh, uh, you know, so if we, if we say started here, say if, we, say if we started here and then drew a line to the ocean, right? Um, depending on, it depends on how you draw it, but on the order of about, six zero miles to the Gulf, to open water, the Gulf of Mexico. Now, again, depends on how we measure it, which direction, everything. Now it's more like 16 miles to the Gulf, to open water. So as we're, as we're Swiss cheesing out this important part of the coastal zone, well, we're, we're doing many things, but one of the things we're doing in the context of today's conversation, which is hurricanes, Hurricane Ida, as soon as the hurricane hits land, it'll start to lose energy. Because that hot, humid water, or the humid air, but the hot water is what is the fuel for these storms. So as soon as it goes onto land, it's not going to stop immediately, but it's going to begin to lose strength. And so we oftentimes refer to healthy wetlands and mangroves and, and, and these natural systems on the edges of our continents as speed bumps for, wetland, for hurricanes. Because they, they knock down the speed, they reduce the intensity, and they help, help us, right? 
But as we've lost tens of miles of that speed bump, that means, in the case of New Orleans, because everybody always wants to talk about New Orleans, uh, uh, it means that the hurricanes are much close. It, it is the city is effectively much closer to the open ocean. It's much more like uh, taking the full brunt of, for example, hurricanes as as with today. Cool. Questions? Okay. So since Katie couldn't join us, I'm going to try this. Now this seemed to uh, this seemed to uh, get weird when I try to play it from within PowerPoint. So I'm going to try to play it outside of PowerPoint. Is on item. I want to bring David back to weigh in for us tonight. All right, David. If you're someone thinking about evacuating, obviously time running out. What point do you need to leave, and where should you go? Well, first let's remember we've got a lot of folks under a mandatory evacuation. Tonight. This is two days so ago. This is two days ago. Told to evacuate. Please heed those warnings because your emergency managers fear there's going to be levee overtopping in those areas or you're in areas that don't have levee protection at all. So he's at the time he's looking at the tracks from the National Hurricane Center where, they, where they're predicting it's going to go. This is a local. These are all local New Orleans television stations mostly and social media that I grabbed. If you're not comfortable staying with the storm, you want to get on the road at daybreak tomorrow. I imagine we are going to probably have a significant amount of traffic on our freeways and highways, so you want to be careful to leave as early as possible. Now, this is the area we're saying to avoid in red. And if you think about it, the track is going to be something like this up Interstate 55. So it could be bad to the west and especially to the east. Now, if you go to the east, we feel good about places like Montgomery and Atlanta. And of course, somebody said, can I go to Tallahassee? Yeah, you can go to Tallahassee. If you go west, recommend going to Texas or far northwest Louisiana, perhaps to Little Rock. Those seem like the best choices. And you know, we know that this storm has got the very perfect environment to not only survive, but to even strengthen very warm water, obviously a key factor. But how important, David, is the depth of that hot water? You know, we're talking about two types of water here. What I'm showing you right now, these are the sea surface temperatures, all right? The red, the dark red here, that's 86 degrees. Look at this purple, 87 degrees. And we normally need, what, 80 degrees plus water to sustain a hurricane. The Gulf is plenty hot for that. But we want to look beneath the surface to the depth of the heat of the ocean. And we look at our ocean heat content. And you've heard over the years probably about the loop current. It kind of comes and goes. Here it is. This year it's there. Last year it wasn't very prevalent. That means the depth of the ocean heat goes in. So, um, so that so he, what he's saying is the the hottest hot water is just aligning very well with the, this particular hurricane track, right? So it's it, the hurricane would come anyway, but this is helping it gain strength as it was moving in. That's what he's trying to say. Bay down, and that allows for additional energy for the hurricane to feed on. And the storm goes right over the loop current, a two, a three, and then you have a four. So that can make a big difference in what Ida's potential is going to be. All right, now play history professor for us. How rare is it for a Cat 4, 140-mile-per-hour storm to make landfall on the Louisiana coastline? Okay, well, let's assume, and let's hope it doesn't happen this way, but let's assume the forecast verifies that a Category 4 strikes Terrebonne Parish. First of all, it would be the strongest storm for Terrebonne Parish so I'll first just say, uh, again, it's not my, not my hurricane lecture, but we only started naming hurricanes recently. Okay, So we talked about the Galveston hurricane of 1900 because we didn't have a name for it. So th right here, he, he, some of these just have a, uh, a term that newspapers or people named. Our process now in the modern time is we, we have a unique name. And so, so some of these you'll see names, others you'll see descriptions for. Betsy in 1965. We only have five instances since the mid 19th century of Category 4 or 5 winds in Louisiana. The only time we've had Category 5 winds, Lower Plaquemines Parish with Camille in 1969. That's just south Otherwise, of New Orleans. The last island hurricane, the Shamir Kamenata, Betsy, and just last year, 150 mile per hour Laura striking southwest Louisiana. If this happens, and gosh, let's hope that's not the case, it would indeed be very good. Oh, yeah, so really interesting information there. Um, thanks so much, David. Wait, that was it. Hurricane Ida made landfall officially at Fort Fouchon as a Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles per hour. 
As predicted, it's the governor of Louisiana. Service, this is one of the strongest storms to make landfall here in modern times. That's New Orleans. This is that New Orleans uh, this morning, I think. This is the time to stay inside. This is the mayor of New Orleans two no, days ago, or yesterday. This is yesterday. We need you to stay in in this point forward all morning, all afternoon, all evening. Now is the time that we have been preparing for and even waiting for as it relates to Hurricane Ida. Again, this is the time. Keep all warning. Ensure that you shelter in place, you hunker down. Once the storm has passed, you need to be prepared for shelter in place for the first 72 hours. You should know that the entirety of the Louisiana National Guard has been activated and currently more than 4,900 guardsmen are out in support of current operations. Uh, and I know it may not seem this way right now for many people out there across our state. Heavy traffic today on I-10 in New Orleans as people try to get out of the city. This is yesterday. Hurricane Ida. Makes landfall tomorrow. Oh, yes, two Hours days ago. We're stocking up on necessities. Forecasters say the storm is expected to bring 130 mile per hour winds, a dangerous storm surge, and flooding rain. Ida is forecast to come ashore on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina hitting the Gulf Coast. Prepare for damaging wind, power outages, heavy rain. So as we go through these, I want you guys to start making note of what the themes are. Right? I mean, I, I picked these, right? So this wasn't a totally random selection. But I want you to tell me what the themes are that we keep hearing, right? How people describe the, the coastal management situation, how, um, uh, uh, how, how they describe it if, it if they say it's the worst thing ever or we're going to be able to be okay or what have you, and complicating factors. So, so jot down a couple notes as we're going through this or things that stick, stick in your head. Tornado. What I'm told is that this storm in no way will be weakening. President Biden has already signed a disaster declaration for Louisiana. People and supplies are in place to deliver food and to help restore electricity after Ida moves through. We're in a very dangerous place for our hospitals, as you know. Uh, yesterday's count, we still have 2,450 uh, in our hospitals with COVID, on top of all of the other uh, individuals who are in a hospital, and, and, and quite frankly, evacuating uh, our children in hospitals is not going to be an option. There aren't hospitals with the capacity to take them, and so making sure that they can maintain power uh, and water, uh, have access to, to all the food that they need, and, and oxygen, uh, and other things is going to really consume a lot of our time and attention uh, because we we know that, that the lights could be out, power could be out. Uh, for weeks. I know the storm is focused on southeast of Louisiana, but we're going to be sheltering people uh, across the state in, in big numbers and, and for quite a time, uh, it appears. And, and the challenge there is, is, or the challenges you always have, but additionally COVID, because you don't really want to keep people in a congregate shelter any longer than actually in the Hurricane Ida battered Louisiana. Conditions worsened in New Orleans Sunday night when the entire city lost power. Energy New Orleans blamed the storm for catastrophic transmission damage that left the entire city in the dark. No answer yet on when the power would be restored. So I'll just say down power lines, down power lines caused uh, or the proximate cause of um, the Thomas fire, campfire, the current fire that is maybe going to become the largest in state history this year. Um, the CZU complex, I mean, it goes on and on, right? So this notion of this old infrastructure that was invented over 100 years ago does not do well in our climate change world. It doesn't matter if we're talking about, you know, the desert southwest, if we're talking about the Gulf Coast. Um, and so what you'll find is newer developments underground their, their power poles, right? One, they, they say it looks nicer, but more importantly, it's just much safer, right? We don't have the winds causing sparks and arcs. When we have a situation like this, you don't have to go out and repair poles, et cetera. So that's, there, there are many examples of how lessons in one situation that might not look similar to our situation really 
um, really are either exactly or with just a little slight perspective shift are very similar to, to our situation. Ida made landfall earlier Sunday near Grand Isle, Louisiana, at a Category 4 storm with winds of 150 miles an hour. The only road out of the city was under six feet of water. Buildings, housing, emergency services were also underwater. It struck on the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. The storm shredded buildings as the eyewall moved on shore. In Cutoff, Louisiana, the storm blew the roof off the Lady of the Sea Hospital. Ida is weakening as it moves inland, but it's still wreaking havoc. In La Plaza, about two hours north, streets turned into rivers. More than 800,000 people in Louisiana were found powerless on Sunday. More than 20,000 in Mississippi. Okay, this is just a few. This is just like 60, 90 seconds, something like that, of just some raw footage of the storm as it was as it was hitting. So it goes without saying, but you pretty much can't stand up in this kind of wind, right? You, you can, you have to hold on to something from just being blown around. And also all kinds of objects become bullets, right? A little toothpick can be, can kill you, right? So, so it's not a place you want to be out and about in these, uh, unprotected in these, these areas. Okay, this is where uh, we usually stay when we when we go to New Orleans. So we stay in um, uh, a, a regular house in a in a community, um, basically a suburb of New Orleans in Saint Bernard Parish. And these are some of the security feeds from um, the areas near where we stay um, uh, yesterday. And so these are sort of just before the storm hits, and then after the storm was hitting. Um, and these are like firehouses and, and security cameras, stuff like that. And again, very flat area right next to the Mississippi River. A little bit of water first. And then a lot of water. Those are, those are uh, uh, crap, those are, yeah, whatever, lobster pots, crab pots. I think this might be the last one. What's that? Yeah, I know. It's pretty crazy. Eye wall. The worst of the eye wall is over Grand Isle. I'm really afraid what I'm going to see when we get some pictures out of there in Grand Isle. It may look a lot like Mexico Beach did with Michael. A real a significant damage. And then we saw it here just south of Hoba, doing so much damage where Derek is, finally to the west of New Orleans, and then uh, now moving up into parts of Mississippi. Tornado watch is still in effect. Tornadoes are still possible today. There goes the storm off the east coast by Thursday into Friday. A lot of rainfall, maybe four to six inches of rain still coming down. But this is a graphic that is on my Twitter feed, and I, I hope you can go there and read it if you really want to learn something about the wind damage. A category one, we're going to call it one times multiplier. That's a category one 75 mile per hour storm. To get to a category three, it's 30 times more powerful and potential for damage than a pop category one. You get down to Ida, Ida was 256 times more potential damage than a Category 1 75 mile per hour storm. 
that's the people I'm going to be waking up to today. Can we get some pictures? We're not going to like it. No, yeah. So look, it's not just a four. It's a strong four that it made landfall at. And I, I do just wonder, do you think that we, I, I know you're waiting for the pictures, but we really don't have a grasp on what this storm has brought at this point. We really don't. I mean, a lot of it was what we call marsh and ditch land, especially when it got over Grand Island. Yeah, and marsh and ditch land. Down when it got to Derek's position there in Homa. Didn't slow down much even until it got to the west of New Orleans. The winds there were somewhere between 100 and 110. Gusts along Lakefront Airport in New Orleans proper, 90. So this storm was still a big storm as it was moving on shore because it was running over water. It was running over the swamps and the ditches. As, as uh, General Armory would like to say, boy, there's no land down there. That swamps and ditches. And that water and those swamps and the ditches, it's real. It's not any cooler than the ocean or the Gulf of Mexico, but that's why this one did not slow down like a typical land-falling hurricane that does hit land. Five miles to southeast of Baton Rouge. Let me show you this. Let me show you this Power Alley map across that area. So all of that red, essentially, again, the entire city of New Orleans has no power. The only... Again, to orient you, this is that big lake, Lake Pontchartrain. Here's the Mississippi River. Again, here's the big crescent, the so-called Crescent City, the Bend. This is the French Quarter, and so this is a this is basically the urban the the, the urban core of New Orleans. Lower Ninth Ward is over here. Um, here's that that curve where I said we have our NGO and we do our work in this area where Katie's house is. Providing you heat from generators in some areas, and we have some live shots to show you of dark New Orleans now. So. Uh, you can see a couple this is a couple hours ago. There, this is a couple hours ago. Uh, but really, the entire city powerless as those heavy plus mile power winds move through New Orleans and continue to do so. Winds up uh, right now around 80 miles per hour. That's kind of a, a, a view that shows you how breezy it is uh, in New Orleans right now. Again, gusts around 80. This is still a Category 3 storm, which is expected to be downgraded to a 2 by the next hour. Then a 1 overnight, 75 miles per hour wind by 1 o'clock. This is the last one. This is just a this is just a, a reporter driving around for thirty seconds. So this is uh, east of or excuse me, west of New Orleans, sort of more towards the coast. Close toward Destrehan. We've still got a flash flood warning in effect for both St. John the Baptist and St. Charles Parish. If you look at this radar picture, though, uh, you know, Peyton and Tamika have heard me mention this a lot. What we're watching is something that we call the fetch. Uh, and you can see this fetch of moisture. You see it here? Uh, this fetch of moisture that is now moving its way across coastal southeast Louisiana and into the Mississippi coast, this band of rain is still going to be capable of producing rainfall rates of two to three inches per hour, and I really hope that we don't see this expand closer to the metro area. Soils are very saturated. Sometimes with this band of rain, that fetch that tail end of this moisture, uh, especially along the Mississippi coast. Look at Hancock and Harrison County. Let me put a estimate here. Yeah, Scott, uh, I was going to say, this, this band okay. is never ending. So, so look at these rainfall amounts. These are likely, these are only 12 hours. Let me see if I can get you um, a... 24-hour uh, look at this, and I have to go to some of these settings here. 
Well, so I, uh, a couple of people were asking about tornado warnings and watches. Could those still be possible today? Okay, look at this. I just put it. Yes, there, there is. And okay. the, the tornado threat, especially for Mississippi, we've still got uh, a tornado uh, potential throughout coastal Mississippi and southeast Louisiana. Do you see these numbers behind me, this scale? These may be underdone. We were talking about the potential. Remember yesterday on air, uh, I was showing forecast models that said some areas could see 10 to 20 inches of rain. We hoped uh, that those down. Just to clear, 10 to 20 inches of rain would be a good rainfall year for us for the whole entire year, right? They're talking about in one you know, 24 hour period. Those would not verify, but in a lot of spots, we did have some numbers within that range, if not even higher, uh, in some of these locales. I'm going to try to put an estimate on some of these numbers close towards Manchac, 14 inches of rain. Radar, Doppler radar indicated over parts of uh, where we had the high water rescues close towards Laplace and Destrahan. Okay, so that's crazy, right? That's two feet of water over the whole area, right, as far as the eye can see um, in, in just the last day. And uh, that would be crazy for us, right? We cause all kinds of rivulets and, and dirty ocean and stuff. But imagine now you're on a pancake of a landscape where there basically is almost no vertical relief, right? That's a huge um, a recipe for a huge problem. So, okay, so that's it. So I just wanted to give you guys a sense of what, what do you guys think? Did you notice any, any uh, similar description there or similar patterns or stuff? Yeah. Uh huh. Good. Yeah. Right. Yeah, float, yeah. <laughs> it was so much wind, it got airborne. Yeah, no, so that, so, um, so, uh, yeah, let's see, how can I, sh can I show that somewhere? Do I have anything? Um, uh, I guess this picture maybe right here. So, um, so yeah, what Brittany's talking about. If I put this up, thanks for a second. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Janet. Thanks. I'm going to do that. Um, uh, so uh, in our part of the world, these these guys go this way, right? So so this is the wind. The wind's... And so, um, again, here's here's uh, essentially the, the Mississippi River is going down this way, but the winds are, are, are blowing this way, right? So, so when you have a situation like this, which is just about... I mean, it can always be worse, but this is pretty close to the worst situation because the winds are essentially blowing up the Mississippi. And then in these, these big, large uh, lakes, Lake Pontchartrain and stuff, the water is getting essentially shoved up against the city of New Orleans, the, the built infrastructure. And so um, uh, this is happening, happen what you just described with the water sort of essentially being shoved uh, up, upland, basically, shoved shove up the watershed. That happened in 2018, so it's not unprecedented, but it's still very unusual, right? Um, and uh, and with these intense storms, you can get reversing of normal activities, right? Normal behavior of of critters and sediment and water and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it is it is pretty crazy. There, I, I I I didn't have much time to put together all these videos. I just did this really quickly before class, but um, but. Uh, yeah, so there were some images of these bar, uh, well, I don't know if they're barges, but boats, um, large vessels, looked like they were uncrewed or they broke loose or something, and they were um, heading, and they were heading um, towards each other, and, and they were going, one was going up, up the river. Normally they would float down there, right? They were kind of like going up the river to bang into uh, each other, which is pretty crazy. So that's unusual. Good. What else? What else do you guys notice? Yeah. Yeah, Martian ditch land, right? So um, uh, that's very much a um, 
a uh, sort of urban perspective, right? So there's a lot of folks that live uh, in the rural countryside in Louisiana, and they, um, I found to, generally speaking, really really dig the wetlands and really dig the you know, nature and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, as with so much of our society, we are now a, um, a primarily urban species. Starting in 2007, we switched over planet-wide. More humans live in cities than live outside of cities now, and it's only getting more and more intense with each census. We find the, the um, concentration of urbanization grows, and people are more disconnected from things. So the notion of ditch land is, means you know, crap land. And uh, in the case of Louisiana, that's where they, we've, we've dug out the wetland to make it useful. And so, so you need sediment to do something. So a lot of times you'll dig it out, throw it here and, and pile it up so the ground is higher. So you get higher elevation and dry it out. But that creates, you know, areas of pure standing water all the time. And so, so yeah, so there's that, that sort of attitude of the unimportant or, or the less important of the uh, natural coastal ecosystems that provide lots of ecosystem services and stuff, but people don't necessarily always perceive that. Other observations or other things people noted, yeah? Would it be able to show the national water being drained from uh, maybe the other Lake Central and Lake Superior? Yeah, good question. So um, so uh, our friends in uh, uh, Plaquemines, it's all good. They said you can get up to four sandbags yesterday, so it was cool. They were doing something, right? Four whole sandbags, because if we had four sandbags, we could defend this room really well, right? That'd be great. Um, uh, in, in all fairness, uh, everybody was confined. No one was allowed to go out. So no 911 service. Well, first, 911 system went down yesterday. But, but setting that aside, even if it was up and running, um, nobody, uh, none of the National Guard, none of the you know, paramedics, nobody like that was allowed to go out until the sun came up this morning. So that, that's one of the reasons why. It's just it's too dangerous. When the, in the past, when they've sent people out when the storm is still there, those first responders get killed or those first responders need to get rescued. So, so today, so if I made this video tomorrow, I'm, you'd see a lot more of that. But, but good observation, good observation. Uh, yeah. Are you seeing this in the Chicago wildlife where they're trying to find those sinkholes? Yes. Maybe the last year or something where they were trying to find them. Do you notice anything about the ocean and the way the ocean got there? Is there any interest in doing some studies on that? Yep. Right. Totally, totally. So, um, so yeah. So have a look at. I mean, so this uh, Katrina was is, was. So there's there are various issues with how we currently rank um, how we currently rank hurricanes, but I'll I'll leave that aside. I'll just simply say one of the things people have suggested we need to factor in is the size, not just the wind speed and the intensity, but how big it is, because especially in terms of disaster response. That's huge, right? You're right. If, if our city is screwed, that's bad. But if every city is screwed for 500 miles each way, that's a that's a way different picture, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have one satellite image as Katrina is as uh, was, was approaching the coast, and and the the here there's some rain bands that are hitting out in this part of South Texas, but with Katrina, it actually filled up everywhere from Texas all the way over to Florida, and and this and Ida is very large as well. Uh, Katrina is even bigger, but but that's I think maybe what's less appreciated. So um, uh, again, in my hurricane lecture, I have, I have an example of after Katrina hit, where the disaster zones were declared, and it's basically basically you know over half the state of California, equivalent to over half the state of California in terms of size, and so the scale of these issues is also really really important. So that matters for uh, coastal management. Because even if we finally convince everybody in our hometown or our home county that we, we're going to take this action, we're going to we're going to do this with the porch, or we're going to do this with changing our energy systems or whatever, it you know, if those other towns over there are still using, for example, power lines, you know, or, 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 you know in the air power lines, then we're still vulnerable. So it means we have to have more regional approaches, more more broader scale thinking, uh, in addition to our local conversations and stuff. Yeah, 
he can say, like, oh, well, I would do this and I would do that and I would do this. But for him, that's an outside of his plan. So having people come by saying, like, oh, don't just say, like, you can run your own plan and you can believe me and you'll be God's servant and you'll be next in line. But it, to us, it, it sounds really silly for them to be just like, oh, well, God, you would have just said this now. Like, that, that doesn't make any sense because Jesus is not. Right. So it would be, I think it would be beneficial yeah. to have people talk into it and, and know what they're supposed to say and do. Yeah, I mean, I mean an exa- one example of that is um, not, not specifically coastal, but one thing I think about a lot is um, in the last couple of years, I'm starting to see lots of fires in the southeast, Georgia, places like that. They don't really have a tradition to deal with wildfires. They, they, they never really, I mean, they have had fires, but it's not big. But now with drought and things happening, they are having to deal with some of that stuff. And so, so yeah, it, there's always this grass is always greener. And those idiots have tornadoes. I'd never live with their tornadoes, right? And then our friends in Louisiana, God, you got earthquakes and everything's burning all the time. Like, why the hell would you want to live there, right? It's, it's, it's um, everywhere has its risks, right? And so the, 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 the decision going forward is what's an acceptable amount of risk and for wherever we pick, there definitely are areas that are just totally crazy. And no matter what you think or what your passion is, whatever, we shouldn't be doing that in that spot, right? That's a hard thing to sell to American independence, right? Well, our constitution says I can do whatever the hell I want. It doesn't. You can't rape people in your house, right? But people will tell you that you can do whatever the hell they want on their property. Um, and so, so this comes up with some really fundamental aspects of our culture, and it's non-trivial, but to go forward to have effective management, we do have to decide what is acceptable and what isn't. And what's worked in the past is not working now, and it's not it's gonna work even less well as we go into the future. So we do need some new models and new approaches. So I think that's that's I think fair to say. Good. Any last observations on uh, any of those things we were hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So so, um, and in fact, that's that's often the case with our disasters or these crises. There's the proximate thing, the initial thing. There's the there's the ship hitting the hitting the, the bridge, right? You're like, oh crap, the bridge is gonna fall down, right? So you first kind of deal with that and get get people off the bridge so they don't fall in the water and stuff. But then you realize, oh my god, the bridge, the the, the banging into the bridge broke open the hold. So now there's all this oil on the surface, and and on and on and on and on and on. So so there's Again, there's the um, what we're gonna do in the first instant, first first few hours, first few days, and then there's all these other things, and it turns out that's where most of, or not, I should be careful with that. Oftentimes, that's where some of the greatest damage comes from. Is are these are these earthquake or earthquakes? Are these tornadoes? Is the the cholera that spurs from the fact that we didn't have clean water and and on and on and on. So, so there's these disasters have a have a life cycle, and the the proximate event, the the hurricane coming over your house, is obviously you know a bad thing, but it, when it goes away from your house, it doesn't end, right? There there are other threats and other things that, that emerge. So yeah, good point, good point. Other observations. All right, cool. Um, all right, I think that's maybe that's all I was gonna say about this coastal management threat that we're facing right now.